Defining boundaries within a system is incredibly important, but can be a little tricky. One way to start is by looking at your entities, looking at the properties, see which ones relate, and then splitting it apart. Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design and in .NET. So if you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. All right, so I'm in my loosely coupled monolith. Uh, link will be in the description. I've been using this pretty much in all my uh, videos lately. And I have kind of four predefined boundaries here, a catalog, purchasing, sales, and shipping. All right, so let's take a look at the catalog project. I have a entity framework DB context here that has uh, products, which is uh, for our product model. And we can see it has a ID, which is a GUID, a name, price, cost, and quantity. Now, if we look on how this is actually used, if I jump over to sales, for example, um, I have a purchase product. So let's take a look at this. We have our, our command here, we're using mediator. So we have a purchase product where we just take the product ID. Um, we have our controller, which is gonna basically enqueue our request. And this is really the heart of the matter here is what we have here is we're taking a dependency on the I product query and we're basically getting that product out so that we can create a new order specifically for that, uh, that product. And this is why we need it is because we need to define the price in our new order that we add. So I'm just gonna jump over to get product so you can see how this works. So I am now back on the catalog side and I have a product query, my I product query. And it's basically just fetching out that product from the DB context that I just showed you and then creating a new um, kind of a DTO that we're using, a product that has the ID name and price. So we're not exposing the actual model. We kind of mapping this to something else that we're using within, within sales. So sales is referencing the contracts, which has this interface, and this is the implementation. So if I go back to purchase product, we need that to get the product price from the catalog because we need to add it when we're uh, basically ordering the actual item itself. So where I think a lot of this goes wrong is this notion of what I call entity as a service, meaning that you have a, a context or a service that owns a particular entity and that entity is only lived there. All the information about that entity is one kind of one owned place. In this case, in my example, catalog. But that's not actually really the case. When you really want to start looking at splitting up and defining boundaries, is you're not really going to have a sole entity um, live in one place entirely. It's likely going to live kind of the same idea, but in many different places. So in this example here where sales needs the actual price from the catalog, the reality of it is, is the catalog, this particular boundary, probably doesn't actually even own the price of the product, rather would, uh, sales would. So the idea here being is, let's take this product model, I'm gonna leave it here, but I'm actually gonna go into sales and I'm gonna add a new class called product model. And we're gonna copy this over but I'm gonna get rid of pretty much, the only thing I'm gonna keep is the ID and the price. So this obviously will be the same concept as a product within the catalog, but it is gonna own the price. If I jump back to the product model over here, I'm gonna be basically removing the price from it. So you're gonna have two different boundaries that are own, kind of share the same concept of something and they'll share that same ID, so it's still that same product, but each different context may own different pieces of data that basically are belong to it. The price doesn't really have any bearing on the cost or the quantity. And I'll use some other examples here in a second for some of these. So it's starting to look at the properties, where should they really be owned? And don't think that just an entity has to live in one context alone or in one service. So if I jump back over to the sales context, and product model and i'm adding our idea of a product here our concept of a product if i go back to here instead of actually needing this dependency i'm going to get rid of that ultimately let's get rid of the product query and then our product 
would actually be from our context where we can actually get the pro products here. So our request, product ID, I guess I should turn this into a where, and we'll do select. So now we actually got our price from our context ourselves, and now we have no outside dependency on the catalog itself. All right, so looking at this product model again in the catalog, I have cost and quantity, and we'll consider this like the quantity on hand from the warehouse of what we actually have. Now, the thing with cost is when you're actually talking to people within the domain and you're talking to somebody within purchasing, when they're talking about the cost, they're actually referring to the vendor price. So the, per, the, the price that you're actually paying from the vendor or from the manufacturer. So you can see how, again, this particular cost likely, again, isn't in the catalog, but it's more probably in purchasing and it having a product model where it would have that ID, it would have this cost and likely something else like the, the vendor ID or the manufacturer ID or how you actually purchase this product in details about that. So you can see how cost probably doesn't belong here either. It probably belongs in purchasing. All right, so lastly, we have quantity and I'm gonna use kind of a real domain example just to kind of illustrate something is that the quantity on hand of something in the warehouse, you could easily think, okay, this doesn't actually belong here at all. It probably belongs something like in a, a separate warehouse context that I haven't defined here yet. That would make per, uh, perfect sense. But in a real situation, the quantity on hand, yes, that may live in the warehouse, but let's say in our sales, sales context, we actually needed it for validation to say, hey, we have some business rule where you can't order any products if we don't actually have them on hand. Now, the reality of it is in most situations that I've been in in distribution, that's actually not the case at all um, because they don't necessarily just use the quantity on hand. So what would really happen is sales would actually have a, a separate concept of called available to promise. So this is a big business function, also known as ATP, that let's say catalog, it still has our SKU or ID, our name, our description. We've already defined that sales has that same concept of a product, has that shares that same ID SKU, and it's gonna have the sale price. Now it's gonna also have something called ATP. And then in purchasing, we've already kind of talked about that it's going to have that same product again, but it's going to have the cost. And we may have a separate boundary for our warehouse that has the actual quantity on hand. So now you can see we no longer have this one sole entity representing an actual product. We have the same concept of a product, but it really has kind of four different mutations in different boundaries, in different contexts, in each context owns certain concepts. So let's jump to ATP on how it actually works. So we're basically using messages and eventing to kind of calculate what ATP is. So in the case of when purchasing places an order to an outside vendor, we basically publish that message saying, hey, here's how many products, uh, how, like of this product, how many quantity that we've ordered and when that order is expected to come in. If invoicing an order gets placed and we invoice a customer, we can then take that amount out to say, okay, sales, here's this event for order invoice. Now you're removing this amount from your ATP number. And for the warehouse, it may have inventory adjusted events where people are doing stock counts to say, okay, we actually found more of this product or some of the product, uh, product is damaged or we can't find any, maybe some was stolen. So here's an inventory adjusted event. And that way sales can keep track of what its ATP number is so that it can use that as the business function for deciding whether you can or cannot order products. So one of the keys to kind of defining where these boundaries are is again, start looking at your entities. And if you have an entity that has a lot of properties on it, they don't really relate to each other. They're generally used in one other context. Get rid of the idea of that this entity as a service or an entity needs to live only in one place. 
It does not. You can kind of share the concept or that identifier that relates to that, uh, that entity, but have the information um, that is owned by one boundary live in that boundary. Get out of this idea of an entity needs to live in one place. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want more software architecture and design related videos in .NET, make sure to subscribe. Thanks.